Chapter 2, Repentance These scholars have said that it is necessary to repent from every sin. If the offense involves the right of Allah, not a human, then there are three conditions to be met in order that repentance be accepted by Allah. Number one, to desist from committing it. Number two, to feel sorry for committing it. And number three, to decide not to recommit it. Any repentance failing to meet any of these three conditions would not be sound. If this sin involves a human's right, it requires a fourth condition in order to absolve oneself from such right. If it is a property, he should return it to its rightful owner. If it is slandering or backbiting, one should ask the pardon of the offended. One should also repent from all sins. If he repents from some, his repentance would still be sound according to the people of sound knowledge. He should, however, repent from the rest. Scriptural proofs from the book and the sunnah and the consensus of the scholars support the incumbency of repentance. Allah the Exalted says in the Quran, وَتُوبُوا إِنَ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ And all of you beg Allah to forgive you all, O believers, that you may be successful. And Allah also says, إِسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ Seek the forgiveness of your Lord and turn to Him in repentance. And Allah also says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha. O you who believe, turn to Allah with sincere repentance. 13. Abu Hurairah, Radiyallahu anhu reported, I heard Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, By Allah, I seek Allah's forgiveness and repent to Him more than 70 times a day. Collected by Al-Bukhari. Commentary 1. It is an inducement for seeking pardon and forgiveness. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whose past and future sins were forgiven, asked Allah's forgiveness. Then how about us, who commit sins on a regular basis? Should we not have more need to seek pardon and forgiveness from Allah? 2. Sincere and ceaseless prayer for pardon is essential so that sins committed by us unintentionally are also forgiven. The above hadith lays great emphasis on seeking pardon. 14. Al-Aghar ibn Yasar al-Muzani radiyallahu anhu narrated that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Turn you people in repentance to Allah and beg pardon of Him. I turn to Him in repentance a hundred times a day. Collected by Muslim. 15. Anas ibn Malik al-Ansari Radiyallahu anhu, the servant of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Verily, Allah is more delighted with the repentance of his slave than a person who lost his camel in a desert land and then finds it unexpectedly. Collected by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. In another version of Muslim, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Verily, Allah is more pleased with the repentance of his slave than a person who has lost his camel in a waterless desert carrying his provision of food and drink. He, having lost all hopes to get that back, lies down in the shade and is disappointed about his camel. When all of a sudden he finds that camel standing before him, he takes hold of its reins and then out of boundless joy blurts out, O oh Allah, 
you are my slave and I am your Lord. He commits this mistake out of extreme joy. Commentary. Number one, this hadith also deals with the inducement and merit of repentance and pardon for sins. Allah is highly pleased with repentance. Number two, one will not have to account for a mistake made without any purpose and intention. Number three, it is permissible to take an oath to stress one's pardon. And number four, one can quote an instance for the purpose of understanding and elaboration. 16. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, radiyallahu anhu, reported, The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah the Exalted will continue to stretch out his hand in the night so that the sinners of the day may repent and continue to stretch out his hand in the daytime so that the sinners of the night may repent until the sun rises from the west. Collected by Muslim. Commentary. This hadith confirms an essential attribute of Allah, that is, the hand which he stretches out any time he wishes, without drawing similarity to it nor interpretation. Such was the attitude of the pious predecessors with regards to all of the essential attributes of Allah. It is deduced from this hadith that if one commits a sin during any hour of day or night, he should immediately seek the forgiveness of Allah as a result. 17. Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu reported, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, He who repents, before the sun rises from the west, Allah will forgive him. Collected by Muslim. Commentary. Tawbah means returning to Allah from sins. When a person commits a sin, he goes away from Allah. When he repents, he returns to Allah and desires for being pardoned by him and getting near him. This returning towards him is Tawbah. When it is said that Allah turns towards him, it means that Allah accepts his repentance. 18. Abdullah ibn Omar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhumah reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah accepts a slave's repentance as long as the latter is not on his deathbed, meaning before the soul of the dying person reaches the throat. Collected by At-Tirmidhi, Commentary. The word ghaghara means the stage when the soul is about to leave the body and reaches the throat. In other words, the time when one suffers the agony of death. Hadith Hassan means the hadith, the authenticity of which is connected without any technical defect. Their narrators, however, are next to those of hadith sahih. In the opinion of the muhaddithin or the hadith scholars, Hadith Hassan is also reliable, like Hadith Sahih. 19. Zir ibn Hubaysh radiyallahu anhu reported, I went to Safwan ibn Asad radiyallahu anhu to inquire about wiping with wet hands over light boots while performing wudu. He asked me, What brings you here, Zir? I answered, Search for knowledge. He said, Angels spread their wings for the seeker of knowledge out of joy for what he seeks. I told him, I have some doubts in my mind regarding wiping of wet hands over light boots in the course of performing wudu after defecation or urinating. Now, since you are one of the companions of the Prophet wasallam, I have come to ask you whether you heard any of the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ concerning it. He replied in the affirmative and said, He ﷺ instructed us that during a journey, we need not take off our light boots for washing the feet up to three days and nights, except in case of major impurity, meaning after sexual intercourse. In other cases, such as sleeping, relieving oneself, 
or urinating, the wiping of wet hands over light boots will suffice. I then questioned him. Did you hear him say anything about love and affection? He replied, We accompanied the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a journey when a Bedouin called out in a loud voice, O Muhammad! The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied to him in the same tone, Here I am. I said to him, meaning the Bedouin, Woe to you! Lower your voice in his presence because you are not allowed to do so. He said, By Allah, I will not lower my voice. And then, addressing the Prophet wasallam, he said, What about a person who loves people but has not found himself in their company? The Messenger of Allah wasallam, replied, On the day of resurrection, a person will be in the company of those whom he loves. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then kept on talking to us and in the course of his talk, he mentioned a gateway in the heaven, the width of which could be crossed by a rider in 40 or 70 years. Sufyan, one of the narrators in this tradition said, This gateway is in the direction of Syria. Allah created it on the day He created the heavens and the earth. It is open for repentance and will not be shut until the sun rises from that direction, meaning the west, on the day of resurrection, collected by a tirmidhi. Commentary 1. We learn from this hadith that in ablution, it is permissible to wipe over light foot coverings rather than washing the feet. It is called mas. The period in which mas is intact in case of travelers is three days and three nights, while for the residents it is one day and one night only. A precondition for it is that light foot coverings should be clean and worn after full wudu. Ankles should also be covered. In case of breach of ablution, the wiping over the socks is sufficient and there is no need for washing the feet. Wudu is invalidated by sleeping, call of nature, and passing of wind. This is called Hadith Asghar. In the case of Hadith Akbar, which occurs because of coitus, menses, and wet dreams, washing of the whole body becomes obligatory. It means that the privilege of wiping over the foot coverings is also finished in this case, in the same way as it does after the expiry of the period specified for it. 2. One should associate himself with the pious people so that he is counted among them. One also comes to know many other points from this hadith which every intelligent person can understand with a little effort. 20. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu anhu reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, There was a man from among a nation before you who killed 99 people and then made an inquiry about the most learned person on the earth. He was directed to a monk. He came to him and told him that he had killed 99 people and asked him if there was any chance for his repentance to be accepted. He replied in the negative, and the man killed him, completing 100. He then asked about the most learned man in the earth. He was directed to a scholar. He told him that he had killed 100 people and asked him if there was any chance for his repentance to be accepted. He replied in the affirmative and asked, Who stands between you and repentance? Go to such and such a land. There you will find people devoted to prayer and worship of Allah. Join them in worship and do not come back to your land because it is an evil place. So he went away and hardly had he covered half the distance when death overtook him. And there was a dispute between the angels of mercy and the angels of torment. The angels of mercy pleaded, This man has come with a repenting heart to Allah. 
and the angels of punishment argued, he never did a virtuous deed in his life. Then there appeared another angel in the form of a human being, and the contending angels agreed to make him arbiter between them. He said, Measure the distance between the two lands. He will be considered belonging to the land which he is nearer. They measured and found him closer to the land of piety where he intended to go. And so the angels of mercy collected his soul, collected by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. While in another version, he was found to be nearer to the locality of the pious by a cupid and was thus included among them. Another version says, Allah commanded the land which he wanted to leave to move away and commanded the other land, meaning his destination, to draw nearer. And then he said, Now measure the distance between them. It was found that he was nearer to his goal by a hand span and was thus forgiven. It is also narrated that he drew closer by a slight movement on his chest. Commentary 1. One comes to know from this hadith that the gate of Tawbah is open even for the worst of sinners, and Allah forgives everyone provided he repents sincerely. The conditions for such repentance have already been discussed. 2. It is the duty of a religious scholar that while discussing a problem, he should keep in mind the psychological aspects of the questioner and adopt a policy which neither causes a change in the injunction of Allah nor makes the sinner reckless in his sins out of frustration. 3. When a situation warrants, angels appear in the form of men by the command of Allah. 21. Abdullah ibn Ka'b, who served as the guide of Ka'b ibn Malik, radiyallahu anhu, when he became blind, narrated, I heard Ka'b ibn Malik, radiyallahu anhu, narrating the story of his remaining behind, instead of joining Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he left for the battle of Tabuk. Ka'b said, I accompanied Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam in every expedition which he undertook excepting the Battle of Tabuk and the Battle of Badr. As for the Battle of Badr, nobody was blamed for remaining behind as Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the Muslims when they set out had in mind only to intercept the caravan of the Quraysh. Allah made them confront their enemies unexpectedly. I had the honor of being with Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam on the night of Aqaba when we pledged our allegiance to Islam and it was dearer to me than participating in the Battle of Badr. Although Badr was more well known among the people than that, and this is the account of my staying behind from the Battle of Tabuk. I never had better means and more favorable circumstances than at the time of this expedition. And by Allah, I had never before possessed two riding camels as I did during the time of this expedition. Whenever Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam decided to go on a campaign, he would not disclose his real destination till the last moment of departure. But on this expedition, he set out in extremely hot weather. The journey was long and the terrain was waterless desert. And he had to face a strong army. So he informed the Muslims about the actual position so that they should make full preparation for the campaign. And the Muslims who accompanied Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam at that time were in large number, but no proper record of them was maintained. Kaab further said, Few were the persons who chose to remain absent, believing that they could easily hide themselves, 
and thus remain undetected. Unless revelation from Allah the Exalted and Glorious was revealed relating to them. And Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam set out on this expedition when the fruits were ripe and their shade was sought. I had a weakness for them and it was during this season that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslims made preparations. I also would set out in the morning to make preparations along with them, but would come back having done nothing and said to myself, I have means enough to make preparations as soon as I like. And I went on postponing my preparations till the time of departure came. And it was in the morning that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam set out along with the Muslims. I had made no preparations. I would go early in the morning and come back, but with no decision. I went on doing so until the Muslims hastened and covered a good deal of distance. Then I wished to march on and join them. Would that I had done that. But perhaps it was not destined for me. After the departure of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Whenever I went out, I was grieved to find no good example to follow, but confirmed hypocrites or weak people whom Allah had exempted from marching forth for jihad. Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made no mention of me until he reached Tabuk. When he was sitting with the people in Tabuk, he said, What happened to Kaab ibn Malik? A person from Banu Salama said, O oh Allah's Messenger, the beauty of his cloak and an appreciation of his finery have detained him. Upon this, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiyallahu anhu admonished him and said to Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, By Allah, we know nothing about him but good. Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, however, kept quiet. At that time, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw a person dressed in white and said, Be Abu Khaythama. And it was he. Abu Khaythama Al-Ansari was the person who had contributed a sa' of dates and was ridiculed by the hypocrites. Ka'ab ibn Malik further said, when the news reached me that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on his way back from Tabuk, I was greatly distressed. I thought of fabricating an excuse and asked myself how I would save myself from his anger the next day. In this connection, I sought the counsels of every prudent member of my family. When I was told that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was about to arrive, all the wicked ideas vanished from my mind. And I came to the conclusion that nothing but the truth could save me. So I decided to tell him the truth. It was in the morning that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrived in Al Medina. It was his habit that whenever he came back from a journey, he would first go to the masjid and perform two raka'ah, and would then sit with the people. When he sat, those who had remained behind him began to put forward their excuses and take an oath before him. They were more than 80 in number. Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam accepted their excuses on the very face of them and accepted their allegiance and sought forgiveness for them and left their insights to Allah until I appeared before him. I greeted him and he smiled and there was a tinge of anger in that. He then said to me, come forward. I went forward and I sat in front of him. He said to me, what kept you back? Could you not afford to go in for a ride? I said, O oh Allah's messenger, by Allah, if I were to sit before anybody else, a man of the world, I would have definitely saved myself from his anger on one pretext or the other. 
and I have a gifted skill in argumentation. But by Allah, I am fully aware that if I were to put forward before you a lame excuse to please you, Allah would definitely provoke your wrath upon me. In case I speak the truth, you may be angry with me, but I hope that Allah would be pleased with me and accept my repentance. By Allah, there is no valid excuse for me. By Allah, I never possessed so good means and I never had such favorable conditions for me as I had when I stayed behind. Thereupon, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, This man spoke the truth. So get up until Allah gives a decision about you. I left and some people of Banu Salama followed me. They said to me, By Allah, we do not know that you committed a sin before. You, however, showed inability to put forward an excuse before Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like those who stayed behind him. It would have been enough for the forgiveness of your sin that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have sought forgiveness for you. By Allah, they kept on reproaching me until I thought of going back to Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and retract my confession. Then I said to them, Has anyone else met the same fate? They said, Yes, two persons have met the same fate. They made the same statement as you did, and the same verdict was delivered in their case. I asked, Who are they? They said, Murara ibn al-Rabi'a al-Amiri and Hilal ibn Umayya al-Waqifi. They mentioned these two pious men who had taken part in the Battle of Badr, and there was an example for me in them. I was confirmed in my original resolve. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited the Muslims to talk to the three of us from amongst those who had stayed behind. The people began to avoid us and their attitude towards us changed and it seemed as if the whole atmosphere had turned against us. And it was, in fact, the same atmosphere of which I was fully aware and in which I had lived for a fairly long time. We spent 50 nights in this very state and my two friends confined themselves within their houses and spent most of their time weeping. As I was the youngest and the strongest, I would leave my house, attend the congregational salah, move about in the bazaars, but none would speak to me. I would come to Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as he sat amongst the people after the salah, greet him, and would ask myself whether or not his lips moved in response to my greetings. Then I would perform salah near him and look at him stealthily. When I finished my salah, he would look at me, and when I would cast a glance at him, he would turn away his eyes from me. When the harsh treatment of the Muslims to me continued for a considerable length of time, I walked and I climbed upon the wall of the garden of Abu Qutada, who was my cousin, and I had a great love for him. I greeted him, but by Allah, he did not answer to my greeting. I said to him, O Abu Qatada, I adjure you in the name of Allah. Are you not aware that I love Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I asked him the same question again, but he remained silent. I again adjured him, whereupon he said, Allah and his messenger know better. My eyes were filled with tears, and I came back climbing down the wall. As I was walking in the bazaars of al Medina, a man from the Syrian peasants who had come to sell food grains in al Medina asked the people to direct him to Kaab ibn Malik. People pointed towards me. He came to me and delivered a letter from the king of Ghassan. And as I was a scribe, I read that letter whose purport was, 
It has been conveyed to us that your friend was treating you harshly. Allah has not created you for a place where you are to be degraded and where you cannot find your right place. So come to us and we shall receive you graciously. As I read that letter, I said, this too is a trial. So I put it in a fire in an oven. When 40 days had elapsed and Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received no revelation, there came to me a messenger of Allah's Messenger and said, Verily, Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has commanded you to keep away from your wife. I said, Should I divorce her or what else should I do? He said, No, but only keep away from her and don't have sexual contact with her. The same message was sent to my companions. So I said to my wife, you better go to your parents and stay there with them until Allah gives the decision in my case. The wife of Hilal ibn Umayyah came to Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and said, O oh Allah's messenger, Hilal ibn Umayyah is a senile person and has no servant. Do you disapprove if I serve him? He sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, No, but don't let him have any sexual contact with you. She said, By Allah, he has no such desire left in him. By Allah, he has been in tears since this calamity struck him. Members of my family said to me, You should have sought permission from Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam in regard to your wife. I said, I would not seek permission from Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for I do not know what Allah's Messenger might say in response to that, as I am a young man. It was in this state that I spent 10 more nights, and thus 50 days had passed since people boycotted us and gave up talking to us. After I had offered my Fajr prayer, on the early morning on the 50th day of this boycott on the roof of one of our houses and had sat in the very state which Allah described as, the earth seemed constrained for me despite its vastness. I heard the voice of a proclaimer from the peak of the hill Salah shouting at the top of his voice, O Kaab ibn Malik, rejoice! I fell down in prostration and came to know that there was a message of relief for me. Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had informed the people about the acceptance of our repentance by Allah after He had offered the Fajr prayer. So the people went on to give us glad tidings and some of them went to my companions in order to give them the glad tidings. A man spurred his horse towards me to give the good news. And another one from the tribe of Aslam came running for the same purpose. And as he approached the mount, I received the good news which reached me before the rider did. When the one whose voice I had heard came to me to congratulate me, I took off my garment and gave them to him for the good news he brought to me. By Allah, I had possessed nothing else in the form of clothes except those garments at that time. Then I borrowed two garments, dressed myself, and came to Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. On my way, I met groups of people who greeted me for the acceptance of repentance, and they said, Congratulations on the acceptance of your repentance. I reached the masjid where Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting amidst the people. Talha ibn Ubaidillah got up and rushed towards me, shook hands with me and greeted me. By Allah, no person stood up to greet me from amongst the muhajirun besides him. Kaab radiallahu anhu said that he never forgot this good gesture of Talha. Kaab further said, I greeted Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with, 
As-salamu alaykum. And his face was beaming with pleasure. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, Rejoice with the best day you have ever seen since your mother gave birth to you. I said, O oh Allah's Messenger, is this good news from you or from Allah? He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, No, it is from Allah. And it was common with Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that whenever he was happy, his face would glow as if it were a part of the moon. And it was from this that we recognized his delight. As I sat before him, I said, I have placed a condition upon myself that if Allah accepts my tawbah, I would give up all of my property and charity for the sake of Allah and his messenger. Thereupon, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Keep some property with you, as it is better for you. I said, I shall keep with me that portion which is in Khaybar. I added, O oh Allah's Messenger, verily Allah has granted me salvation because of my truthfulness. And therefore, repentance obliges me to speak nothing but the truth as long as I am alive. Kaab added, By Allah, I do not know anyone among the Muslims who has been granted truthfulness better than me since I said this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. By Allah, I do not know anyone among the Muslims who has been granted truthfulness better than me since I said this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. By Allah, since the time I made a pledge of this to Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have never intended to tell a lie, and I hope that Allah would protect me against telling lies for the rest of my life. Allah the Exalted, the Glorious, revealed these verses. لَقَدْ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ فِي سَاعَةِ الْعُسْرَةِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا كَادَ يَزِيغُ قُلُوبُ فَرِيقٍ مِّنْهُمْ ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّهُ بِهِمْ رَؤُوفٌ رَّحِيمٌ Allah has forgiven the Prophet, the Muslim immigrants who left their homes and came to al Medina, and the Ansar who followed him in the time of distress, after the hearts of a party of them had nearly deviated. But he accepted their repentance. Certainly, he is unto them full of kindness, most merciful. وعلى الثلاثة الذين خلفوا حتى إذا ضاقت عليهم الأرض بما رحبت وضاقت عليهم أنفسهم وضاقت عليهم أنفسهم وظنوا ألا ملجأ من الله إلا إليه ثم تاب عليهم ليتوبوا إن الله هو التواب الرحيم. And he did forgive also the three who did not join the Tabuk expedition till for them the earth, vast as it is, was straightened and their own selves were straightened to them. And they perceived that there is no fleeing from Allah and no refuge but with him. Then he forgave them. Verily, Allah is the one who forgives and accepts repentance. Most merciful. Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu attaqu allaha wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen. O you who believe, be afraid of Allah and be with those who are true. Kaab said, By Allah, since Allah guided me to Islam, there has been no blessing more significant for me 
then this truth of mine which I spoke to Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and if I were to tell a lie, I would have been ruined as were ruined those who had told lies. For Allah described those who told lies with the worst description He ever attributed to anybody else as He sent down the revelation سيحلفون بالله لكم إذا قلبتم إليهم لتعرضوا عنهم فأعرضوا عنهم إنهم رجس ومأواهم جهنم جزاء بما كانوا يكسبون They will swear by Allah to you when you return to them that you may turn away from them so turn away from them. Surely they are impure, and hell is their dwelling place, a recompense for that which they used to earn. <laughs> they swear to you that you may be pleased with them, but if you are pleased with them, certainly Allah is not pleased with the people who are rebellious. Kaab further added, The matter of the three of us remained pending for decision, apart from the case of those who had made excuses on oath before Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he accepted those, took fresh oaths of allegiance from them, and supplicated for their forgiveness. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept our matter pending till Allah decided it. The three whose matter was deferred have been shown mercy. The reference here is not to our staying back from the expedition, but to his delaying our matter and keeping it pending beyond the matter of those who made their excuses on oath, which he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted, collected by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Another version adds, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam set out for Tabuk on Thursday. He used to prefer to set out on a journey on Thursday. Another version says, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to come back from a journey in the early forenoon and went straight to the masjid where he performed two raka'ah. Afterwards, he would seat himself there. Commentary This hadith contains many aspects of warnings and advices. Number one, a Muslim should always speak the truth, even if he has to face troubles and turmoil for it, because the pleasure of Allah lies in the truth. Number two, one must avoid at all costs the attitude of hypocrites because eventually one is ruined by it. Number three, in spite of hardship and stringency, one must take part in jihad. Number four, for the admonition and exhortation of others, it gives justification for the economic boycott of even sincere Muslims who adopt wrong methods. Number five, one must face with forbearance the difficulties which come in the way of deen. Number six, it is not praiseworthy that one gives in charity all the property he has. One must keep what is needed for the lawful needs. Number seven, it is lawful to give something by way of gift and reward to a person who congratulates in the events of happiness. Number eight, the ability to seek pardon is a gift from Allah for which one must express gratitude to Him. Number nine, any promise that one makes must be kept. 22. Imran ibn Hussein al Khuzai, radiyallahu anhuma, reported a woman from the tribe of Juhayna came to Allah's Messenger وسلم, while she was pregnant from adultery and said to him, O Messenger of Allah, I have committed an offense liable to the prescribed punishment. 
so exact the execution of the sentence. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called her guardian and said to him, Treat her kindly. Bring her to me after the delivery of the child. That man complied with the orders. At last, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded to carry out the sentence. Her clothes were secured around her and she was stoned to death. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led her funeral prayers. Omar submitted, O Messenger of Allah, she committed zina, and you have performed the funeral prayer for her? He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, Verily, she made repentance which would suffice for 70 of the people of al Medina if it is divided among them. Can there be any higher degree of repentance than that she sacrificed her life voluntarily to win the pleasure of Allah the Exalted? Collected by Muslim. Commentary. This hadith highlights the following five points. One, it confirms the validity of the punishment of Rajam for the adulterer. That is to say that he should be stoned to death. 2. The merit of sincere pardon. 3. The description of fear of Allah as well as of accountability on the day of resurrection by the Prophet's companions and their preference for punishment of sins in this world rather than in the hereafter. 4. It is permissible to perform the funeral prayer of one who has been guilty of major sins provided he has not been taking them as lawful, because in that case, there is danger of disbelief. 5. A pregnant woman cannot be punished with rajam until she gives birth to the child and the specified period for suckling the baby is completed. 23. Ibn Abbas and Anas ibn Malik, radiyallahu anhum, reported, that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, If a son of Adam were to own a valley full of gold, he would desire to have two. Nothing can fill his mouth except the earth, meaning of the grave. Allah turns with mercy to him who turns to him in repentance. Collected by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Commentary this hadith deals with man's greed and his lust for material wealth. Only the person who has a perfect faith can save himself from it. 24. Abu Huraira, radiyallahu anhu, reported, Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, Allah the Exalted smiles at two men. One of them killed the other, and both will enter Jannah. The first is killed by the other while he is fighting in the cause of Allah. And thereafter, Allah will turn in mercy to the second and guide him to accept Islam. And then he dies as a shaheed, meaning a martyr, fighting in the cause of Allah. Collected by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Commentary. Even the greatest sins including those which one has committed before embracing Islam, are forgiven by repentance. Smiling is also one of the attributes of Allah, although we are unaware of the nature of it. <laughs>